Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today we are taking a look at Griffons, legendary beasts that combine the features of an eagle and a lion. Being a mix of such animals, it has long been considered as a particularly majestic and important legendary creature. So let's see if we can honor it and reimagine it as a real living being. So, of course, here's a thank you to everyone who wanted to see this, which was a lot of people, and to our patrons and channel members, who voted for this episode in our exclusive polls. If you too are enjoying our videos, please consider supporting the channel by liking and subscribing, joining our Patreon, or becoming a channel member to get early looks at all our creatures and vote on future episodes. Now, without further ado, let's get started. While dramatic changes in size and ecological niche are not at all unheard of in the study of biology and evolution, it is nonetheless a fascinating subject to observe and analyze, as it can result in new possibilities opening for organisms, which then can evolve into completely different creatures. Such is the case of a certain clade of monotremes, which became bigger and increasingly predatorial as they migrated north from their place of origin, in Oceania. As they migrated and diversified, island hopping all the way to the continent, many species descending from this clade established themselves across Asia and Europe, including many well-known species, such as the owl bear, a creature we now understand to be a monotreme rather than a bird. On the westernmost part of this clade's distribution, along the mountainous regions of Eastern Europe and Central Asia, is genus Leopteros comprising the many species of animals collectively known as griffons, some of which live as far as northern Africa and India. Griffons are mountain-dwelling animals that will hunt from the heights, searching for prey by using their acute eyesight and ear tufts, which help them direct sound towards their ear in place of proper external structures like those of other mammals, also providing them with a valuable tool for communicating with one another. Once they have found suitable prey, they will dive down from the peaks, using not wings, but a skin membrane called patagium, folded and invisible while they are on land. This membrane extends between their limbs, held at the front by a bony spore similar to that of flying squirrels, which gives this membrane a greater surface and allows the griffon to steer as it glides helped by the uropatagium that extends between their hind limbs and tail. This membrane allows them to cross the distance between the peaks they inhabit and the plains where their prey is found. And, while not enabling them to fly, they are enough for them to quickly and silently close the distance that separates them from their prey. These predators usually strike during the day, when most large predators are less active thus ensuring there will be less competition as they hunt. This also allows griffons to take advantage of the intense sunlight, which will prevent their prey from looking up and seeing their predators approaching. Their coloration also helps them avoid detection, as their reddish fur helps them blend in with the rocks as they stalk their prey, and with the vegetation as they feed. Their darker back and lighter underside help this effect, reflecting light in a manner that flattens their figure, further helping them blend in with the background. Furthermore, their dark back also helps protect them from the sun thanks to its higher concentration of melanin, a pigment that dissipates UV radiation. Although griffons are not particularly strong, their hunting method allows them to catch their prey by surprise, after which they can lethally injure them before their prey is able to either escape or fight back. Still, some griffon species have a dense mane around their neck that helps protect them from strikes from their dying prey. Their beaks, although soft, like those of other monotremes, are in fact a cover for hard and sharp bone projections developed from their jaws, 
which can serve both for inflicting a lethal neck wound and for tearing off their prey's flesh. Thanks to this hunting strategy, the prey of griffons tend to be incredibly varied, including deer, goats, gazelles, and, especially in modern times, horses. Once it was even believed they were capable of taking down prey as large and well protected as elephants and crocodiles. But this is merely a result of griffons, like most other large predators, being perfectly fine with feeding on carrion should the opportunity arise. Casual observers that saw griffons feeding off the corpses of these animals would, naturally, believe the predator to have slain them themselves. Another particularly interesting piece of lore that would arise around these creatures was the belief that they would dig for gold in the rocks around their environment. This is a misinterpretation of geophagy, the act of eating clay or soil performed by griffons and many other animals as a way of self-medicating. In the case of griffons, this is done in order to neutralize many irritating compounds ingested by their prey, which are in turn ingested by the griffon as soon as it feeds on its prey's stomach. The reproductive habits of these animals, however, have also given credence to this myth. In contrast with other monotremes, griffons mate for life, an adaptation that helps them better take care of their eggs. As a result of this, they are capable of laying a greater amount of eggs, having one parent staying to keep them warm while the other leaves the nest to feed. These eggs are what help create the image of griffons as gold hoarders, as these eggs are golden and reflective. This helps camouflage them among the surrounding rock, making potential predators more likely to leave them alone. But once the puggles are born, more complications are bound to arise. Baby griffons are naturally curious and energetic, and may run into trouble quite easily as they play and stray from the nest. These babies are, unfortunately, quite an easy catch for even small and medium-sized predators, which stalk the griffon's nest in search of unguarded babies. To stop this from happening, adults will drive away or outright kill any animals in the immediate vicinity of their nests, many times even actively seeking individuals that have taken one of their young, not resting until they have exacted their revenge. And that's it for speculative biology look into griffons, another fascinating creature from classical mythology that has finally made it to our channel, and one that, of course, took quite a bit of tinkering to get right. Beginning with its identity, it being a mix of mammal and egg-laying bird made it hard to take on, and the main idea by our patrons, making it a monotreme, worked quite well. I will admit, I was nervous about making two giant predatory monotremes capable of gliding in a row. But what you gonna do, am I right? A particularly interesting aspect of working on this creature was realizing it was not originally conceived as a flying creature. In fact, many early descriptions have hints that they were not even winged, and others, such as the account by philosopher Apollonius of Tiana, mentioned them having membranous webbed feet that only allowed for short distance flight. Which... Sure, okay. But at least made for a more direct translation towards a membrane like that of a flying squirrel. They would only come to be seen as masters of the skies later, as Christianity assigned its role as ruler of the land and skies, a symbolism based on their own religious beliefs and because they have wings, so of course they had to fly. But having membranes still worked better for this type of organism, in my opinion. Another aspect of the mythology of griffons that took a backseat was their relationship with gold, both mining it and hoarding it in their nests. This was done because there is a possibility that this has nothing to do with griffons, 
but was in fact added from the myth of gold digging ants. Which may sound weird, but you should remember many of these myths were formed by obtaining and translating accounts from people around the ancient world that spoke very different languages. And so, lots of translation and interpretation errors can happen in the process. In the end, we got a gliding, predatory mammal that superficially resembles both eagles and lions, and I think it works great for our version. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. And remember, if there's any type of creature you'd like me to give the speculative biology treatment in the show, please sound off in the comments below. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center. Hey, Peter here. I heard you were doing an episode on me. Are you gonna reimagine me as a giant bee like you did with the dwarves? Yeah. What? No, the video is already over. It's not even about you. Get out of here. Ah, crap. Oh well, guess I'll just go home. See you later, Swerg or whatever your name is. Yeah.